My dearly beloved in Christ, you know that the Feast of the Resurrection is considered the greatest feast day that we celebrate in the entire year for several reasons. First of all, our Lord indicated that his resurrection from the dead would be the ultimate proof that he was who he claimed to be, the Son of God. When the Pharisees said, show us a sign, he said to them, destroy this temple, referring to his body, and in three days I will raise it up again. And on another occasion, he said, just as Jonas the prophet was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth, buried for three days before he rise from the dead. And he mentioned the resurrection several times to the apostles, but as the evangelists say, they didn't understand what he was saying. In fact, when he finally did rise from the dead, the apostles had a difficult time believing it. We read tomorrow on Easter Monday an interesting apparition of our Lord after his resurrection to two disciples, one of them named Cleophas. We don't know the name of the other. We read of this account in the Gospel of St. Luke, that they were leaving Jerusalem. After our Lord rose from the dead, it was early on Easter Sunday morning, they left Jerusalem. Maybe they had lost faith in him. And they were on their way to a town called Emmaus. And on the way, our Lord came and joined them. And he asked them, what are the things you are talking about as you walk along, sad? And they said, are you a stranger that you don't know what has been taking place in Jerusalem the past few days? And he said, what? And they went on to explain that Jesus of Nazareth was arrested by his enemies and cruelly tortured and put to death. And they said, and not only that, but several of the women of our company frightened us by saying that he had risen from the dead. In other words, they doubted. And he said, oh, foolish and slow of heart to believe in all the things that were written. And thus it must be. It behooved the Christ to suffer and then rise from the dead. In other words, the resurrection is even greater <clears throat> because of the extent of the torture and suffering at the time of the death of our Lord. His res resurrection was even greater than if his death had not been so ignominious and so painful. The resurrection then is, we might say, the foundation of our faith. St. Paul says, if Christ be not risen from the dead, your faith is in vain. <clears throat> so we believe our Lord rose from the dead, but it is not just a feast of faith, a feast day on which our faith is predominant. And we should thank God every day for the gift of faith. How many there are in the world who have no faith, <clears throat> who do not believe in Jesus and all that he came to teach us? Pity them. Then there are those who have the faith, but don't live it. It reminds me of a story of a man in Boston. And some years ago, one of our parishioners there approached this man who was her neighbor. And he was around 70 years old, had been baptized, raised a Catholic, and she was asking him to come to Mass. And he refused. And she said, well, aren't you... Don't you want to live your faith? And he said, and she said it sent shivers up her spine. He said, I know I am going to hell. I know that I will go to hell after I die. Can you imagine? So here's a man who had faith. He knew the faith, but didn't live it, didn't want to live it. Chose rather to enjoy the paltry pleasures of this world rather than to carry the cross and live the commandments and save his immortal soul. What a frightening thought. So we have the faith. Thank God for that gift. But now we must live our faith. <clears throat> and this reminds me of what St. Louis Marie de Montfort says in his booklet 
on entitled Friends of the Cross. He says, these are the two groups that appear before you each day, the followers of Christ and the followers of the world. There are only two groups. And he says, the followers of Christ are encouraging one another, saying, let us carry our cross. Let us be obedient to the commandments. Let us pray. Let us practice the virtues, and so forth, exhorting one another. On the other hand, the followers of the world are saying, let us rejoice and be merry. God did not make us to damn us. He's not going to send us to hell just because we're not perfect. Let us enjoy ourselves. We're only living a short time, and so on and so, and so forth. And St. Louis adds, and so they persist in their folly. Now, this is not just St. Louis's opinion. Our Lord himself said, strive to enter by the narrow gate for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction and many there are who enter that way. How narrow the gate and straight the way that leads to life and few there are who find it. Many know what they must do, but they choose not to do it. They would rather enjoy the things of this world and hope that they might have that deathbed conversion and save their immortal souls. What a foolish thing to endanger the loss of one's soul in order to enjoy the things of this world. So we, as faithful followers of Christ, pick up our cross and carry it. We follow Jesus, who is our head, our master, our leader. And if the head suffered all that he did and died upon the cross? Shall we, his followers, claim to have another way to get to heaven? A way of comfort and ease? No, we must carry our cross and we must persevere in doing so. Today is a wonderful, joyful feast. It is also a feast of hope, of faith and also of hope because we look forward to everlasting happiness. We know that we have trials, but we also know that they will end. And that if we but persevere, we shall have everlasting happiness with God in heaven. So that is a thought that can encourage us when we have suffering. And this is the thing to keep in mind. As our Lord said, that it behooved Christ to suffer and so enter into his glory. That there are periods or times in our lives of discouragement, sorrow, pain, suffering, carrying the cross. And if we persevere through those times and we persevere in our prayer life and living our faith, it will be followed by joy, by a period of comfort, and consolation. Because in this life, nothing is permanent. If we are experiencing a trial, it will pass. And if we are experiencing joy, it will not last forever. And we must remind ourselves of that. Spiritual writers say in the morning, you should say to yourself, I will probably have a cross to carry today. And if you mentally dispose yourself to carry the cross when it does come, then when you are hit with some disappointment or some trial, you're ready for it. So that when we have, again, joy, everything seems to be going well, we remind ourselves this is a veil of tears and sooner or later a cross will come. But when we have the trial, the discouragement, the darkness, the spiritual dryness, then we persevere in our prayer, trusting in our good Lord, and it will pass. We look forward then to everlasting happiness with our Lord. And let us remember the importance of prayer for the grace of final perseverance. We should ask for this grace every day, that we will persevere to the end, that we will persevere in living our faith. As our Lord said, he who perseveres to the end, he shall be saved. Let us then rejoice in that we have the true faith, 
that we are followers of our Lord who triumphed over sin and death by his resurrection from the dead. And let us remember that we too will join him in the resurrection if we but persevere in living our faith through this veil of tears. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.